Carlos, Carlos is uh, a former PhD student of mine uh, who made his PhD on self-organizing, design and control of self-organizing systems, and who now works at the National University of Mexico, where he's building up his own research group, and will tell us about his latest research there. Yeah. Well, thanks, uh, Francis, for inviting me, and all of you for coming. Uh, I'll speak a, a, a bit an introduction about how living technology can help us solve lots of different problems in, in cities. So uh, I'll speak uh, first about motivations and what we mean by living technology, which at the end is a uh, new name for something that many of us have been doing for several years. And then I'll, I'll mention different areas of uh, urban uh, problems where living technology can can help us improve uh, our situation, then uh, I'll review a bit uh, ways in which this can be achieved, and then some discussion. So, uh, for the first time in the history of our planet, more than half of people living and it's expected that by 2050 this will increase to 70%, we will have a million people moving into urban areas every week all around the world. And this uh, huge migration that's unprecedented is mainly motivated by all the advantages that urban areas have to offer. I mean, usually in cities you have better opportunities, higher salaries, uh, in some senses they might be more energy efficient, so there are lots of attractions uh, for, for people. Uh, better education, uh, better lifestyle, but also such a high concentration of people creates lots of problems. So how can we deal with this uh, city growth uh, uh, so that the cities do not uh, become cancers and kind of suffer from, from their own success? Now. Uh, most of the problems that we face in cities, they are constantly growing. There are problems which are dynamic, they are changed. So we cannot uh, use traditional approaches that try to solve static problems. The, these are non-stationary problems. So the complexity of the problems limits the effectiveness of traditional techniques. If we try to optimize solution for a problem, by the time we implement it, then the problem changes and it's obsolete. Now, uh, we can define living technology as that technology which is based on the core features of living systems, uh, which means that it's, uh, it's adaptive, it learns, it evolves, it's robust, it's autonomous, it's self-repairing, it's self-reproducing. And uh, people who define this consider within the artificial life community, uh, define basically technology as technology which has at least some of these properties. And they also distinguish between primary and secondary living technologies. Uh, primary living technology would be something that you call, like, would con you would consider a, a real living system, like, um, for example, uh, genetically modified or genetically engineered bacteria to produce certain medicine. That would be living technology because the bacteria are alive, and it's technology because we engineer them for our own purposes. Or if you develop some artificial living system for, for some other purposes, like for carbon sequestration, and, um, the, there are many proposed applications, but uh, most of the living technologies that we already have, there would be secondary living technologies, which basically uh, use um, living systems as components of their technology. For example, a, a city, uh, you can already define it as secondary living technology because humans and animals and um, plants interact as parts of these uh, larger technological systems. And the, the metaphor of, of cities as organisms is, uh, I mean, it's not anything new. Uh, I mean, uh, people have been describing cities as, as organisms already for, for quite some time. Uh, why? Because they, uh, they, have, they grow, they, you can describe certain metabolism, and they can 
transform energy and matter and information. They have an internal organization, they have transportation networks, uh, and also the, the communications have been described as nervous systems. Even from the 1840s, uh, the popular newspapers would describe uh, telegraphs as the nervous systems of, of, of the planet, even when they didn't know how the nervous system worked. But the metaphor was already there. And for example, Miller in his uh, definition of living systems, which have uh, how many mm -hmm. properties? 18 properties? 19? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't mention cities per se, but he men does yeah. mention uh, like uh, societies. 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 And if you look at cities, then you could say that, it, that they fulfill all his 18 properties of the living systems. Um, and, and also, for example, Mike Batty recently wrote that uh, the scientific study of cities is transforming from uh, a more engineering, engineering or industrially oriented uh, description of thinking cities as machines and more uh, of thinking of cities as organisms. Uh, I mean, it doesn't really matter what they really are. Uh, what we have to decide is whether the different descriptions are useful for our purposes. And it seems that given the complexity of cities, it's uh, more useful, more fruitful to, to describe them as, as organisms than as machines, simply because a machine has a predefined behavior and cities do not. They, they adapt, they are responsive, they have memory, uh, and many other properties shared with, with other living systems. Uh, and of course there are differences between cities and, and biological systems. Uh, I mean, they, they fall within different universality classes, like the, the scaling laws in biological systems for some properties are the same as for cities, like I, I think for metabolism, but then there are some other scaling laws that are, uh, uh, are not universal with, uh, with living systems. But still, since, since cities are constantly adapting, they share, uh, let's say, more similarities than differences with, with living systems. What are the scaling laws which don't hold? Uh, I, I, I don't remember precisely, but it's the, the economies of scale uh, that make it, uh, I mean, uh, for, for living organisms, uh, the, the more, uh, let's say, there's a scaling law that relates like the mass to the energy, so the, the larger the organism, the more energy is required the, the metabolism. Uh, and for cities, it's, uh, I think, so, so exponential, meaning that the larger cities require less energy per capita. Mm -hmm. So the, the larger the cities, there are... But we've also learned from one of the yeah. talks at the conference that you are there that the scaling laws may not be as universal as the first to be yeah. seen to imply. But, but one of the... I mean, because they, they study, I don't know, like 20-something properties, and some of these... Uh, didn't change, and some of them changed for, for the UK. Yeah, so actually, they, 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 they were very small. small. I think it was a yeah. patent or something like that that gave an, an exploit yeah. that was clearly different from one. Okay. Scaling with a factor of one, that's the <laughs> <laughs> so But also, it depends, uh, it depends a lot on how do you define the, the cities, the, how do you define the urban area. So, that's also a, a, a tricky thing. But, uh, that was an oracle that they were varying. Okay, what do we want to call a city? And depending on how you vary that, you get different results. So yeah, but they I mean, tried out many different ways, and none yeah. of them gave the results yeah, yeah, of yeah, yeah. the original button crew and must study. So yeah. so I mean that's that's still under debate, but uh, I mean we can agree that most of our problems are not stationary, and living systems have to deal with not no stationary environment. So, there, I mean, given all these similarities, we can uh, see lots of promise in living technology to solve urban problems. Basically, because if technology is able to adapt to learn to evolve, then they will be able to adapt to learn to evolve to urban problems as they change. And I mean, uh, as I was mentioning, this is not something entirely new, it's, I mean, the, the, just the terminology of, of living technology is, is new. Uh, Stafford Beer in the early 70s uh, helped the Chilean government of Salvador Allende uh, to, to develop the, the project 
cyber scene, which was like a nervous system for the country uh, based on Telex, which is, uh, I don't know if the young ones here know what Telex is. Very effective version of Telex. You could see it more like a fax, I think. No, oh, because you don't send yeah, well, well it, it was useful for remote communication, set, uh, sending and receiving me, uh, text messages. Uh, so, so they have a, they made a whole network and they had a control room in, in Santiago, in the capital, uh, which looked like the, the, the layer of the villain of a James Bond film, the, one of these that goes off at the end of the film, <laughs> no apparent reason. But, I don't know, that's the way James Bond films used to be in the 70s. So, so they received in, in this brain room or control room information from all of the, the country, of the factories, of the cities, where they were producing what, and what, what were the requirements, their stocks. So uh, th there was a, a very big strike against the government of, of uh, drug drivers. There were only less than a hundred truck drivers loyal to the regime, and still, with, with such few drivers, they were able to, to sustain the, the the stock of the country because they had every day uh, real time information of where were the produce and where it was required and where were the trucks. So, like that, we they, they were able to, to withstand the strike, and, and then when uh, the coup d'état of Pinochet came to be, then, I mean, that, that was the end of, of this project. And more recently, IBM has been uh, doing lots of marketing of the smart cities uh, initiatives as part of, a, of their Smarter Planet campaign. Uh, there's also in Europe the future ICT flagship project, which has been very popular. It has something like 1,500 researchers supporting it, uh, mainly in Europe. There's also something called the Earth 2.0 project, which uses similar ideas, and also in Germany, uh, people working with the concept of organic computing, which is a very similar idea. So, uh, one of the, the largest problems in, in cities is mobility. Uh, how do you get people and, uh, and uh, product, products from, from one place to another. And of course, well, uh, first of all, we can identify eight different factors for mobility. Uh, first of all, is the requirement for transportation. If you don't need to move from one place to another, then there's no mobility problem. Uh, so that's why people uh, promote home commuting, or living at least uh, close to, to your school or work. Uh, also, people speak about local produce so that they don't have to, to, to transport so, much, so many products. Uh, but of course, this is not always possible. So, the, power, the more we, we reduce the transportation requirements, then the, the, the better mobility we will have. Uh, another factor is the shape of distribution. If everybody uh, enters school or work at the same time, then you have more showers. And if you have a flexible, flexible schedule when, where people can choose, let's say, uh, to enter work between uh, 6 and 10, and then to leave between 2 and 6, let's say to, to work 8 hours straight, uh, then they have at least 4 hours where everybody's at the office, and then the rush hour instead of everybody entering at eight and leaving at uh, at four, they would diffuse uh, and you would expect less of a rush hour. And of course, the more passengers, the more vehicles you have on the roads, the the worse mobility you will have, and it's complementing the capacity. The more capacity you have, then you can transport more people, more vehicles. Uh, however, there's uh, a, a well-known behavior that the more roads you build, the more cars you attract. Because then it's like, oh, now we have more capacity, then we can put more vehicles 
on those roads. So many urbanists are against increasing the capacity and actually here in Brussels they reduce the capacity trying to uh, demotivate people from using their cars but it seems, uh, seems it's not enough. Um, <laughs> of course if people are selfish and they kind of change lanes too much and do not respect the traffic rules that's uh, worse for, for mobility than if, if there are some agreements on which side of the street to drive and things like that. Uh, infrastructure and technology is very important because if you have more infrastructure and the technology is more efficient then you can improve the mobility. Uh, also the social aspect is very important because in many, many countries uh, to own a car is uh, something aspirational like a sign of status that you have some economic success. So uh, especially in developing, in developing countries like in America, in China, in India, uh, especially young people, they are bombarded by the media, like, oh, buy a car, buy a car, buy a car, even if they don't really have the money or the means, uh, and that really affects the, the mobility. Still, in many countries, it's becoming uh, socially acceptable or even uh, fashionable not to own a car and use alternative modes of transport. And finally, the planning and regulation is extremely relevant for cities. Uh, we heard to one of the talks about planning in Israel and how it's not followed because there's an interesting phenomenon that they have a plan and say, okay, this city will grow in this direction, then the price of the land of the planned region increase, uh, and then the developers don't want to build it because it's too expensive. So they go outside the planned region and then they lobby so that they uh, let them build in, in that area where they bought the, the land 10 times cheaper. And then they get the permit, and then something like how the cities are, are, are grow into unplanned territory. So it's not only to have plans, but to, to fulfill them. And of course, in many cities, there's not even a uh, plan. So then cities grow as, uh, uh, according to, to the interests of the, of the local builders and contractors and developers. So uh, it, let me mention some some examples of, of uh, how can living technology improve mobility of, of cities. I mean, uh, I, I mentioned these eight factors just to, to give you an idea of the complexity of the problem. It's, I mean, you cannot have like a solution to mobility with just one one project because there are so many factors uh, interrelated that in order to have uh, considerable improvement in mobility, you need several projects to, affect, to uh, contemplate all of these different factors in parallel. Uh, but uh, one of the things we have worked in is on improving public transportation systems. Uh, in collaboration with Luis Pineda, we, uh, we studied a common phenomena that, I mean, it's well known, but it didn't really have a like a general name, so we name it the equal headway instability, which is a common problem in, in, uh, in rail, trams, buses, metros, um, bus rapid transit, even elevators have this problem. Which means, um, it, it, it's the following. Uh, according to theory, uh, passengers will wait less time at stations if, if vehicles arrive with an equal headway. Uh, headway is the time between uh, the, the each vehicle arrives at station, the, the time interval. So, um, uh, assuming that vehicles have a equal headway, then as if passengers arrive randomly, not even assuming that some stations have uh, more demand than others, uh, we can assume that some stations will have more demand, so then this vehicle will be delayed because there were too many passengers here. So then the headway with the previous one increases and with the one behind is reduced. So then at the next station it's uh, a high probability that there will be more passengers so that it will be even further delayed and this will catch up. So you get a plateau formation, that's, that's the precisely the instability of the headway. You have um, positive feedback loops that amplify the delays. 
if one vehicle delays a bit, then uh, it, it gets worse. And I remember when I was living here in Brussels, that's uh, also a common phenomenon. Uh, and to, to the point that in, here the bus line 30, 34, you have three buses per hour, and they come one after the, the other. I mean, there, there should be 20 minutes, 20, 20 minutes ahead of it, and still they manage to, to come together. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's a very basic problem, and it's because that's where the system tends to. It's uh, uh, just on, on stable to have it ahead small delays amplify and then you end up with, with uh, groups of vehicles. And of course it's extremely inefficient because the, most passengers have to wait a long time before any of the vehicles pass. And usually, uh, like in, in bus rapid transit or metro systems where you don't have uh, passing, the first one is very slow and then it reaches the station and people cannot get out and then other people want to get in. And um, and when it finally leaves, there's another one and it's empty. Let, let me show you a video of, of Mexico City's metro. that uh, the travel times will be unaffected and it happens that that, that is not the case. You have equal waiting times at stations. Uh, uh, I mean, if you force equal headways on the vehicles, there will be uh, for sure some stations that will be idling in order to keep up with the, with the headway with the busier stations. And you might have some vehicles having to leave the station before all the passengers are served. So, uh, in this solution, uh, the vehicles are able to adapt by balancing the, the time since the previous vehicle left the station, the distance to the vehicle behind, and the number of passengers at the station. So it's enough flexible so that they can serve better uh, the demand of the passengers. And if there aren't many passengers, they would tend to leave the station, but still without collapsing the system into platforms of vehicles. So even when passengers will wait for a bit longer at stations, once they board a vehicle, they will reach their destination faster. So, so this is something that is now the slower is faster effect, which at the end leads to, to super optimal performance. And also, it's not a predefined solution because you don't really know what will be the demand at each station. Moreover, if it is changing constantly and you don't know where the vehicles will be at which time. So it just adapts locally to, to the demand and to the capacity of each vehicle, how full is each vehicle. And a, a very important thing is that the adaptation of the, of the system matches the time scale at which the problem changes. So for example, uh, there are some adaptive traffic lights that adapt every half an hour or every hour, which is better than not adapting, but I mean, every traffic cycle, you have different number of, of cars coming from each direction. It's much better if your traffic lights adapt at the second scale and not at the minimum scale, and the same 
always the same for, for any system. If the adaptation matches the time scale of the, of the problem change. Yeah, but you can only adapt if you have sufficient uh, time headway. If you don't, like here in Brussels, every minute you cannot adapt yeah. them. You need to stick synchronized flow, yeah. otherwise you, you get collapsed. Yeah. So, well, this all related to, to some of the work I, I developed here on, uh, with Francis on, on self-organizing traffic tests, but let me first show you the a simulation of the public transport system. So let me reduce the speed. So we start with equal gateways. Can you see it more or less? There are five stations and five vehicles. Some passengers arrive randomly. There are not that many passengers. Uh, Observe. Oh, yes. That's not. Yeah. So if you don't put any constraint very quickly uh, for any passenger density you have on, on stable headways, and you can see here that the first vehicle is going very slow and all the other four are behind almost empty. So this one is delaying everybody. And then we propose a method that forces the equal headways. That means that the next one should not start before the one at the uh, following yeah, station. But, but, but they all have, basically, they all have a fixed uh, waiting time at stations, and even if there are passengers uh, oh. trying to board, they, oh, they, 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 they have to wait. But how do you implement Sorry? How do you implement this? You must before who that, start that's, before that's, that's still to be seen. <laughs> that's another <laughs> point. Yeah. <laughs> So here you can see that that the the headways are quite stable. I mean, all, all the all the trains have uh, very similar frequency, so, so you have equal headways, and the passenger delays is not that much. But then, if we let the system self-organize, even for this homogeneous scenario, you start losing the equal headways, but then the total delay time is reduced. But here you split the, the waiting times. You so can see here that the, the, there are more passengers waiting at the stations. And this purple one is the the waiting time at stations, which is increased, it does increase, that's consistent with the theory. Only that the, the they will spend much less time at the train. So you mean the total time between the moment they arrive at the station and the moment they arrive at the destination diminishes? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's why the slower is faster. You can, you can see here that the delay is reduced. Even for this case, when you have like very regular stations, all of them have the same uh, demand. You can move this uh, to have. Um, I mean, to, to have. The, the train starting not, not, not from homogeneous um, the conditions. Um, let me also change the, the density of the, uh, every station. You will have some with higher or lower demand. Uh, and you get actually very similar performance than in a very nice regular case where you can try to attempt to optimize something. And if you force the headways, then you cannot recover if you start from, uh, from a situation without equal headways. And this you can start from a completely aggregated situation, like, like all the trains are here, and it manages to, to spread them nicely and to, to re recover. So, with the equal head headway instability, it's like an inverted pendulum that you want trains to, to be like this, 
but any perturbation kicks you off of the echo gateways and collapses the system. And what we managed to do with this method is to, well, it's, the analogy is not so much that, that you keep the balance, but you actually change the attractor so that now the, the headways are the new attractor. So now the system tends to, to the desired state. And how do you do it with anti fermion Does it mean that uh, things that have paused kind of slow down the one that followed them? Uh, yeah, the, the usual pheromones, that, which are used by, by ant colonies to, to communicate via the environment, uh, usually ants, if they detect some food, they go back to the nest and leave a pheromone trail, and then the pheromone evaporates. So if more ants come, the trail is reinforced, and if it turns out that the food is, is gone or it wasn't such a good option, then uh, it diffuses uh, and it erases. So the pheromone concentration reduces with time. And these are anti pheromones because the idea is the opposite. You have the anti pheromone um, increasing on the rails and then the trains erase. Oh my god. Yeah. So it's just the same but inverted. Um, so, and the more things have passed here in the pheromones, the less the next thing will be inclined to speed up. Yeah. yeah. Yes, so, so they, that's why they try to keep a balance between the, the train ahead and the train behind. Um, well, many of you already know the, this work on the traffic lights, but let me, let me show for other people who don't know, this uh, simulation of an uh, abstract city. Um, usually, cities are coordinated with, with, with a method called the, the, the green wave method. So, we try to synchronize the traffic lights at the speed, at the expected speed of the cars. So, for example, you can see that the cars going south and going east do not have to stop because the traffic lights are syn synchronized appropriately, but if you're going in the opposite direction, you have to stop every now and then. So in radial cities where people live in the suburbs and periphery and work downtown, you just make the green wave in the mornings downtown and in the afternoons uh, to the outskirts. So it's, I mean, it's better than not having any coordination, but it has several drawbacks. For example, in Mexico City, you have traffic in all directions all day. So. <laughs> <laughs> it, it doesn't, I mean, if, if you are against it, it's not useful. And also, if the traffic density is such that the cars cannot keep up with the expected speed, then you cannot catch the green wave and you anyway have to, to stop. And that leads to uh, long queues, and these long queues start blocking the streets. And I don't know if this is familiar. To any of you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, the yellow box. Yeah, the, the, uh, the, the cars are painted blue if they're moving and yellow if they're stopped. <laughs> Slowly, all the everything is stopped. <laughs> yeah. And now, the uh, self organizing method. Let's put density we had first. Uh, each intersection has sensors and basically give preference to the street with a higher demand. So it starts forming plateaus, which is a bit the opposite of what you want in public transport systems. Because in public transport systems, you want to keep them apart, but with vehicles, you want to keep them together because it's easier to coordinate groups of, of, of several cars, let's say plateau of cars, than all the cars individually. So, for example, if you have 100 cars, it's easier to, to coordinate 10 groups of 10 cars than 100 independent cars. Just computation is much, much easier. It's a bit like making a train out of individual cars. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, after some time, in this idealized city, the traffic lights, uh, well, the vehicles actually make the green wave, but then the traffic lights are also promoting the formation of plateaus which can flow uh, through the city because they trigger the green light before they reach the intersection. And then if we increase the, the density, even a bit higher, 
where, where we got the traffic jam. Uh, of course, you you have some yellow cars meaning that they're stopping because um, I mean you have more vehicles than capacity on the streets. The, uh, um, just uh, because of the density, you, you, you cannot have a free flow mm -hmm. um, as you could with, with lower densities. But uh, you have a, actually a maximum flow, meaning that all the intersections are being used by vehicles constantly, so you don't have any wa wasted resources. So, so, I mean, it's not only that it doesn't uh, block, it is that it is as, as optimal as it could be. You, can, you cannot have higher flow than this, because, I mean, all the intersections have been used constantly. Now let's put some more realistic density. <coughs> it's more like Mexico City on a Friday evening. So, of course, I mean, there's almost no space. And in this simulation, if there's no space, you cannot move. Um, so that's why almost everything is yellow. But still, there's a formation of groups of spaces which are a bit dual to the formation of plateaus, which move in the opposite direction than traffic. So, for example, this street goes to the east, and then you have the formation of spaces that move in the opposite direction. So also you don't have, like, uh, you move one meter and then you stop, and then you move another meter and then you stop. But you move something like a block, and then you stop for, for a while, and then you move for a long time. And also these spaces coordinate at the intersection so that they obstruct as much as possible. And I mean, you, you still have flow, so, because the metal prevents the intersections from being blocked. Now, the, there are several other applications of mobility that living technology can offer. For example, real-time information systems uh, can give us, I mean, they, they already give us information to, to make better decisions. Uh, there's lots of research on how to have different sensors and how to integrate di different sensors because you have, uh, for example, radars or cameras or GPS data. How can you process all this information? How can you integrate to have better understanding of what's the traffic state? Not only what's the traffic state, but also trying to predict a bit what will be traffic state because imagine that you have two routes one of them has a traffic jam and lots of people have ways or some other application that tells them do not take this route, take the other route so then everybody takes that other route and then that can be congested so uh, I mean these systems have also to, to take that into consideration to try to predict uh, according to, to the present state and the historic data what would be the, the, the state, let's say, in half an hour in order to, to give suggestions and different suggestions to, to different users, even if they are going to the same group, uh, to prevent these, these situations. Uh, there's also some work to, to develop uh, communication between, uh, automatic communication between vehicles, which in simulations they have shown that you can improve considerably uh, flowing freeways uh, even if you have just 5 or 10 percent of vehicles using this system meaning that they, they tell each other all oh, uh, I had to reduce speed so then you reduce speed but they don't overreact so they um, I mean, what happens in freeways is that uh, one vehicle slows down and then the one behind slows even more and then the one behind slows even more and then uh, finally after five or six cars they have to stop um, and of course you can also have written information for public transport and this can also be applied for, for logistics and there are lots of other applications um, there's already the term called biologistics which is precisely to, to use principles and properties of living systems for, for material with flows why? Because living systems also also have transport of, of material. So I mean, 
from swarm intelligence to, 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 to develop uh, the, uh, delivery routes to, to some other methods that are um, uh, adaptive on the spot. Uh, th there are lo lots of different applications uh, that, that are being developed in, in many areas, not, not only in, in distribution, but also in, in uh, um, Right navigation and in airline navigation, they, they still don't do it. They, they still try to to control everything. And I mean, uh, last week at the conference, there were two or three talks that they were trying to propose solutions because they just have too much traffic, uh, too much air traffic, especially in, in Europe and, and the States. Maybe more in Europe because they, they, they have less uh, available airspace. Uh, and they, they just don't have the space. So if you want to predict everything, then you have to reshuffle and it's, it's not really feasible. And of course that costs lots of money and uh, fuel and everything and nobody's happy. Uh, if you want to very much fly. What kind of methods would they use for these environments? Kind of basic systems, phenomenons or stuff like that? Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, uh, the, there's a paper almost accepted in artificial life that is explaining all, all this in more detail. So it's uh, uh, more like a literature review of what other people have proposed. Um, and also, for example, so, some of the things that we did for public transportation systems could also work for air traffic control, for example. That instead of trying to, to force into, into slots, Okay, you have this slot, and if you don't make it, then we we'll need to find another slot, and then to shop the slot. Then to have the system to, to be more flexible and try to keep local separations, uh, I think that would be much more effective. Uh, what the telecommunications is a huge field, and historically, uh, information technology has reduced considerable communication delays. I mean, sometimes we take it for granted that, uh, I mean, we were telling, we had a four hour conversation to the other side of the planet last, last night, and it's like, oh, oh yeah, that's, that's the way you do it. Uh, but, I mean, less than 200 years ago, in order to get a message across the ocean, it would take, I, I don't know, the fastest ships would take two weeks or something like that. Uh, I mean, it was only w w with the first uh, underwater telegraph cable that some information was able to be more or less real time between Europe and, and America. So, I mean, it, it has really changed uh, our, our society. And of course, we have uh, relevant information, we can make better decisions. I mean, uh, 500 years ago, uh, let's say, in, in Times when, when Mexico was New Spain, the news would take, uh, I don't know, if, if they were fast, it was three months, and if not, it was a year. Also, in times of, of the Empire of Genghis Khan, I mean, they, they would be horseback riding a year back to their capital and things like that. So, uh, and of course, the, the speed of communication and the effectiveness of communication, the pervasiveness, is not only useful for citizens, but also for our devices. Uh, and since these high speeds uh, and high connectivity, they produce a very high complexity. So, I mean, these are problems that are also exhibiting these uh, properties where you have um, uh, shifting demands. So, I mean, the, the uh, the most used example is peer-to-peer -peer networks, where you don't have a fixed network and it's adapting constantly to the changes. So uh, more and more uh, there's research on ad hoc networks, and wireless networks, wireless sensor networks that uh, are relying more and more on properties similar to, to, to living systems to, to fulfill a functionality because you, you just cannot specify what, what would be the load of any telecommunication network or any kind of computer network. Uh, now, also related to, to, to the interest of the global brain, uh, we can use the, these telecommunication networks with sensors and effectors to, to provide
provide timely adaptive governance. So this is also related to, to the work we did here about synchronizing bureaucracies. And also what Marco Rodriguez and, and other people have been doing concerning collective decision making. And open data initiatives have benefited uh, these projects a lot because uh, I mean the data is there and then people can manipulate that data for purposes that not, were not necessarily the original intended. Uh, and also they can promote uh, uh, an increased citizen participation. Uh, just a couple of months ago we had presidential elections in Mexico and it was the case that the mass media would impose uh, their favorite candidates on the population. And in the beginning of the year, actually, a colleague at UNAM uh, made a study on Twitter. He had like minute by minute uh, mood information, uh, mining the tweets that mentioned the different candidates. And he would update on, on what would be the popularity status. So you could very well uh, check the news and then see the history of, of the tweets for that day and see how uh, what that candidate said on that day had affected his popularity on Twitter. Uh, so even when the mass media were bombarding people with biased information about uh, the candidates, you could see that people were making their own decision based on all the non-censored information that was available on, on social networks, which was also, everybody was trying to manipulate everybody else. But um, I think that people were able to, to make a choice because with mass media, you just have one source of information. If, if citizens have multiple sources of information, then they are better informed, they, they can make better decisions, and they're also more inclined to participate. Uh, we, we had a project uh, for citizen participation where people were reporting electoral irregularities, like people would come and offer them money for, for votes and things like that, or pictures of policemen giving away uh, food for votes, and that's illegal in many ways. And we, we always knew that these th things were going on, but with this project we, we got um, a sense of the magnitude at, at, at which they, they were doing this. And, and I mean, even when uh, uh, in, in our group some lawyers made three reports and delivered it to the authorities to, to demand, I mean, nothing will happen, but I mean, we got like 6,000 different reports from all over the country, like documenting all the irregularities that, that they were. And people were very active because before, before these people were like, well, yeah, they're corrupt, but what can we do? And even if it didn't change the election, people were like, yeah, we have, uh, 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 we have a voice, we can make a difference. So I, I think also in, in this way, um, Technology can make our societies more democratic because uh, a few group of people cannot have control over the information that they have now. I mean, in Mexico still, the problem is that only one third of the population has internet access. And a large part of that third is still not in voting age. So it did affect the, the let's say, the, the votes, they, they did change, but I mean, the next election in six years, I'm sure the election will be, will be decided on, on the internet. Uh, as it has been the case in, in other countries which have uh, more, more broader uh, uh, internet coverage. So, this technology can also help uh, not only to have more democratic societies, but safer societies, because uh, we can have living technology uh, it's saying not only to assist the police, but also to have prompt response to, to emergencies, to catastrophes. Uh, if you don't have a centralized command center that has to tell everybody what to do, but the um, society or different urban systems can, uh, with certain autonomy, adapt to, to, to different situations, then they will be able to recover to, to enforce situations much faster. 
And also, if you have urban sensors, they, I mean, like, not only about, about it's not only about having cameras everywhere. So that when you have riots, you will be able to go and prosecute people, um, like in some island north of here. Uh, but also to, to have accountability. I mean, if, if you have open data and you have, uh, let's say, sensors where where you can see uh, who and how uh, spend which money, then let's say people will be less inclined to uh, to, to practice some uh, corruption, which is quite common when you don't have this uh, information processing and. Uh, also, artificial immune systems are, have been proposed to increase safety in, in different uh, aspects. Um, also, we can think of artificial neural systems that, like the one in Chile, they can help uh, increase the responsiveness of, of societies and cities to, to enforcing situations. And, and we could also um, uh, mention the one of the latest books of, of Stephen Pinker, uh, where he claims that uh, society has increased safety with technology. So if, if we follow that rationale, we can see that this technology will, will help us have uh, safer cities. Uh, in the sense that the chance of being murdered has been decreasing constantly. Um, another point, Sustainability can be defined as the capacity to endure. And it's not only about the environment, you know, it's usually mentioned in the environmental context, but also um, you can have so social sustainability and economic sustainability. I mean, if, for example, um, New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. Uh, I mean, it was able to endure socially, but not so much. I mean, they, they lost like half of, of their inhabitants. Um, and of course, with, with economical crisis uh, and all sorts of policy schemes that uh, governments like and uh, banks like, like to play, uh, we don't really have a sustainable economy. And also, if we uh, focus on pollution and resources and efficiency, then there are many aspects which can be improved. So, for example, in, in this sense, uh, there are many people who have been working on, on smart grids. I think there was a, a whole satellite just dedicated to, to smarter grids, how to deliver energy in a more robust way. How, to, how can you prevent blackouts? How can you recover from, from blackouts if you have them? Uh, so, so there's lots of research, and it's the same type of problem. It's changing constantly. In order to, to uh, have a solution to that problem, the solution has to adapt at the same scale as, as the problem. Uh, there are also projects on adaptive rainwater collection. Um, in economy, it's, I mean, it's, Pretty easy. If you produce more than you consume, then you're sustainable. If you don't, you aren't. But uh, I don't know if, if, if some bankers ignore it or pretend to, to ignore it. Um, we can also have adaptive organizations that will uh, promote uh, sustainability, and of course, cooperation is a key element in, in sustainability. Not only people, but organizations and countries do not cooperate, and it will be harder to, to endure. And I mean, of course, all, all the research in evolution of cooperation and, and how can different organizations cooperate is relevant in this area. Living technology can also uh, contribute positively uh, for, for our society and for our culture. Um, we could say that technology has been increasing the current capacity of, of cities in the sense that, uh, let's say, in the, uh, with the development of agriculture that just simply allowed for larger settlements. Just because before you couldn't uh, have too many people living in one place uh, just because there wasn't enough food 
Once you have agriculture, okay, you have you can have cities of more or less one million people. But still, you need to transport uh, the food to, to to the markets, and before it gets spoiled, an irrigation. So let's say uh, during the whole agricultural age, the maximum size of cities was maybe one quarter of a million inhabitants, and all over the world, uh, and in some cities it would go a bit higher than that. Then with the industrial revolution, then a railroad, so then you can bring food from farther distances. So that increased the, the current capacity of cities. And with all the technologies that we are having, it's the, the current capacity of cities is increasing even more. Uh, not only the speed of transportation, it's also the costs, it's the production, uh, information. So uh, on the one hand, our, our cities are able to, to, to withstand more inhabitants, but still we have, say, certain threshold around 20, 30 million that, uh, that that's more or less where Tokyo, Mexico City have stabilized, and there are many other cities which are growing more or less to, to, to similar numbers, uh, but they don't grow beyond that. But still, we, we could imagine that this will uh, increase even more, like the, in, in the east coast of the United States, the region between Washington DC, New York, and Boston, they have all the potential to, to merge into a large urban area, um, precisely with technology. But of course you need adaptive technology if you are uh, willing to, to have so, such large uh, uh, urban areas. And also, I mean, in, here in Europe, I mean, have a big urban spot from, from Paris to Cologne. Uh, I mean, the whole Belgium is almost a, a big city with uh, a few gardens in the other end. And, and since, since it has been shown that the larger the city is, the, the more innovation uh, they, they can withstand. On the one hand, larger cities will accelerate more innovation, but also with technology, we can have the benefits of urban areas beyond uh, the physical cities. I mean, I mean, just with internet, you can be living not precisely in an urban area, it also depends on how you, you define the city, but you can be living, let's say, one hour from a city or six hours from a city, but still have direct connection and contribute to the, to the innovation of that city and get benefits from the innovation of that city. So the, the benefits of large urban areas are growing to, to a planetary scale. But with the internet, we're being able to, to share many of the aspects that were constrained to, to a neighborhood or to a city. Now, the, the, these boundaries are being expanded to, for the whole planet, or let's say for a whole language, which is also becoming globalized. And also, uh, the, the work of Johan Bollen, which I, I, I understand he, he will give a seminar in, in the coming weeks on, on social moods. I mean, what many people have done so far is to detect social moods. But I'm sure that people in marketing are already working on controlling social moods. So how can we make people like our product? But, I mean, if, if we understand that mechanism, we can also um, Think, okay, how, how, how can we guide uh, social moods into uh, a positive social mood? How can we make people uh, happier or more satisfied with, with their life? And, I mean, it, it could also be with, with economical aims. You can also make a business out of making people happy. It's not uh, necessarily it has to be uh, independent of, of that. Uh, and also for steering uh, healthier lifestyles because one of the big uh, challenges of our century is uh, uh, the chronic degenerative diseases and these diseases such as diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular uh, diseases they are so-called non-transmittable diseases because I mean, if I shake the hands of somebody with cancer I, I won't get cancer. Or, I don't know, if, if 
I get blood from somebody from with diabetes, I will not get diabetes. So it's supposedly not contagious. However, the behaviors that increase the risk of all these diseases are contagious. And we are only beginning to understand how this uh, takes place. So the, the better we can steer uh, the social behavior and we can intervene, for example, in this case of, of um, healthy or unhealthy social behaviors, we, we could try to develop social vaccines to prevent the propagation of unhealthy behaviors, which could be also related to drug addiction, and how can, could you inject positive social behaviors, which would be he healthier lifestyles. Uh, so the, the better, I mean, the, the better we understand uh, how is the social propagation of all, all these ideas, then the, the better we will be able to, to influence our society. And precisely, we think technology is helping us to achieve this. Now, this was just like a, a huge uh, catalog of some of the applications of, of, of hidden technology. But then, uh, one of the ways to achieve this uh, at a large scale is to, to use the concept of self-organization as, as a method for developing the technology. And, and the, the, it was precisely the, the topic of my, of my PhD thesis here in Brussels, uh, which is how can we build a self-organizing system so that it adapts to the changing demands Problem, which we find in, in cities, these problems all, all, all around us every day. So instead of, uh, well, what, what do we mean by a self organizing system? Instead of focusing on solving a problem, we focus on assigning the elements so that the elements, by their interactions, they will adapt and find solutions to problems that will be changing constantly. So then when the problem changes, the system self-organizes and adapts to the, to the new configuration. So, of course, this is a bit redundant if our problem is well defined and does not change, but for urban problems, this is very useful because we do not have to pre-specify the problem, just like in the case of the traffic lights or, or the public transport. I don't need to know when the passengers will arrive, I don't need to know when the vehicles will arrive at an intersection. The system is constantly adapting to the current state, to the current demand, and gives an appropriate response for that situation. So it's constantly finding new solutions to problems which are not only empty hard, uh, they could be exponentially hard, which is even harder, for which we have no hope of finding an, an optimal solution. And instead of seeking an optimal solution, we're just seeking to adapt at the scale at which the problem changes. And that's much better than, than trying to adapt and offer new obsolete solutions before we can develop it. So, um, my thesis, this, this methodology is, is described uh, more extensively, but the, the main uh, premise behind it is to design the components of a system uh, uh, using the terminology from multi-agent systems, and then instead of focusing on what's the, uh, the state of the agents, we focus more on the interaction. And then we see which kind of interactions are positive and which interactions are negative. So we can call the positive interactions synergetic and the negative interactions friction. So it, it, it's a premise of, of the methodology, and I'm exactly that authority, but it's very useful for authority to minimize friction and to maximize synergy to increase the, the so-called satisfaction of the system, which is basically to improve the performance of the system. Why is that authority? because we are defining the friction precisely in terms of interactions that decrease the satisfaction or the performance of the system. And we can use this using the concept of mediators to promote and constrain behaviors that will reduce friction and, and maximize synergy. So uh, the main idea is to focus not only on the components of the system but also on the interactions and to try to categorize the positive interactions from negative interactions and to reduce with mediators the negative interactions and promote the positive interactions. And, uh, I mean, we could ask ourselves how useful is it to call uh, cities living systems? And 
I, I, I think beyond the philosophical discussion, if cities exhibit properties of living systems, then we will be more satisfied as citizens. Uh, we will have a higher quality of life if the cities are adapting, if our cities are learning, if they are evolving, uh, so that we are better prepared to, to, to deal with, with our problems. And, I mean, IBM has this campaign about smart cities, but being smart is not enough. You also have to adapt to, to changes in the environment, to learn and to evolve, and all these are properties of living systems. And um, well, also, you, you can measure this in terms of information. Um, we can see living cities as an integration of technology and living systems because, for example, we are embedded in, in a, within cities. So, I think we have some time for questions.